Hello, everyone. Um, good to see so many of you online today. Uh, my name is Rika Le Kierkegaard. I'm program specialist with the HIV and AIDS section at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And I'm right now airing this webinar from my living room um, due to the COVID-19 outbreak in the city. So please bear with me if the sound or anything else is not perfect today. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this webinar, um, which is bringing you the latest evidence and updates on pregnant women, children, and HIV from the 2020 conference on retroviruses and opportunistic infections, which was broadcast from Boston here in the United States earlier this month from the 8th to the 11th of March. I'm honored to open this webinar, which is presented by the highly esteemed um, Dr. Lynn Ofenson. He's currently working as senior HIV technical advisor at the Elizabeth Glaser Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And she was at the National Institutes of Health from 1989 until her retirement in 2014, where she was responsible for program planning and the development and scientific direction of research studies and clinical trials in domestic and international pediatric, adolescent and maternal HIV infection. UNICEF's Learning Collaborative by now has a history of working with Dr. Mofenson on scientific conference webinars, and we're very pleased that she has agreed to curate this webinar for us again today. This year's conference was completely virtual due to COVID-19, so we are many that have really been anticipating this summary, and I think Lynn and the co-organizers have really done a, a fabulous job at sharing the emerging knowledge and learning despite the challenges related to the, the current situation. Related to COVID-19, there was also a special session at CROI, and we will be sharing a few highlights and new research on COVID-19 and HIV at the end of the presentation. The presentation itself will take around one hour, uh, which will be followed by up to 30 minutes for Q&A for those of you who have time to stay on the webinar. So before we get started, I would like to say just a few words um, about the webinar guidelines. If you have any trouble hearing or you have any other technical issues, please send us a message via the chat, the chat box and we'll try to support you as soon as possible. Um, but before writing us, you can try to log in, log out and log in again, restart your laptop or check your audio settings. And please keep your mics on mute at all times to avoid any background noise. And if you have any questions um, during the presentation, please write them at any time during the presentation and we will then take it at the end during the question and answer period. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and all materials will be made available online after the webinar on childrenandaids.org. So please do also help share this recording with any of your colleagues that were unable to join us here today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over uh, the floor to Dr. Lynn Mofenson. Hi, can, uh, Ricky, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Good morning, everybody. Um, please excuse my voice. I am recouping from uh, a cold and uh, have an intermittent cough. Not COVID, I don't think, but um, still, I, it's a little coffee. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say before I start is that there is a longer slide set. We could only select some of the abstracts that I selected um, for this particular presentation, and that should be available on the website as well. So let's start. Um, I'm going to start talking about uh, abstracts related to pregnancy, viral suppression, antiretroviral drugs. And the first abstract is uh, a report on HIV seroconversion during pregnancy at routine ANC in Botswana. And they used program data from routine ANC testing of women at 139 ANC sites between 2018 and 2019. Among women without known HIV infection, the prevalence of HIV infection, known HIV infection is about 20%. Um, women without known HIV infection who were tested at the first ANC visit, 2.9% tested newly positive. And then they evaluated zero conversions among the 7,940 women who tested HIV negative at the first visit and had a repeat test. And there were 17 zero conversions 
for an HIV incidence of eight per thousand patient years, which is well above the incidence levels needed for HIV epidemic control of less than one per thousand person years. So it's still a problem even in uh, Botswana. Uh, the second abstract is looking at detectable viral load in the early postpartum period as a signal of a risk for persistent ongoing viremia and mother to child transmission from Malawi. And these are data from 425 HIV positive women on treatment for a median of 30 months in Malawi HIV clinics. They were enrolled at one to six months postpartum and had a viral load done at enrollment 12 and 24 months postpartum. So if we first look at women who had a viral load less than 40, most of these women remained suppressed in subsequent testing, 98% uh, at 12 months, 96% at 24 months. However, if we look at women with viral load uh, greater than 40 at this first test, you can see the majority of them stayed unsuppressed, 55% at 12 months, 58% at 24 months. And when they did a multivariate analysis, unsuppressed viral load at 24 months was only associated with prior undetectable viral load. And mother to child transmission, there were no infections in women who had all viral load tests less than 40. 10.9% transmission in women who had one or more viral loads over 40. 12.1% transmission in women who had all three viral loads over 40. So this suggests that getting a viral load in the early postpartum period can give you an idea of who's going to be at risk of uh, ongoing viremia. The next abstract looked at detectable viral load in the antepartum period as a signal for risk for postpartum viremia. And this comes from South Africa, 322 HIV positive women starting a Favarin's treatment who had a viral load test in pregnancy at a median of 33 weeks gestation. And then in those who had an initial viral load less than 400, they repeated the viral load within 10 weeks postpartum. Um, and of those who had an initial viral load less than 400, about 89% were less than 100, and 11% were between 100 and 400. And they found antepartum viral load. So this, this slide is postpartum viral load results that are stratified by whether or not the antepartum viral load was uh, less than 100, which is blue, or 100 to 400 in orange. And you can see antepartum viral load less than 100 was highly predictive of remaining suppressed with postpartum viral load less than 100. And antepartum viral load of 100 to 400 in orange was predictive of viral load remaining over 100. And the ability of antepartum viral load to predict postpartum viral load was similar regardless of when the first test was done in gestation, less than or early, greater than 32 weeks, and history of prior antiretroviral therapy use. This next uh, abstract looks at community-based adherence clubs. Um, so they compared community-based adherence clubs versus facility-based care for postpartum women who first started treatment in pregnancy and were stable with a suppressed viral load and seen within 70 days of delivery and followed these women up through 24 months postpartum. And this shows you what the adherence club did. The venue was in the community, such as at a community hall and included group counseling sessions that were facilitated by a community health worker prepackaged medication that was distributed in the community by community health workers, and viral load was done annually. Uh, attendance at the allocated service within three months of referral was higher with the community-based care, 77%, but 90% completed the 24-month postpartum visits in both arms. And there was a 30% reduction in viral rebound in women in the community adherence club in yellow 
compared to the primary health facility in blue at 24 months with a hazard ratio of 0.71. But even so, I'd like to point out that the viral load was greater than 1,029% in this better situation, and 44% were still greater than 50. Um, and although there was a significant reduction in postpartum viral rebound, there weren't significant differences in other maternal and child health outcomes, such as TB, family planning use, um, infant deaths, and transmission. They didn't have any transmission. Uh, this next abstract is looking at carbotegravir. Um, uh, long-acting drugs. So this comes from a phase two, three study of data on carbotegravir ropivirine long-acting drugs in 13 women enrolled in the study who became pregnant while they were on the study. Nine were receiving injections, four became pregnant while they were in the oral lead-in dosing. Following pregnancy confirmation, all of the women stopped their dosing and injections and went on alternative treatment. So this is the first report of pregnancy outcomes in such uh, a situation. So there were four live births with no defects, one possible early miscarriage, two spontaneous abortions in women who had a history of spontaneous abortions, and six induced abortions. This looks at PK data. So the pre-pregnancy carbotegravir levels ranged from uh, two to about five micrograms per ml, which is within the expected range while they were receiving dosing. After the drug was stopped, residual levels remained measurable throughout pregnancy in two of the three women and remained measurable postpartum um, up to almost six months postpartum in two of the three women. And this shows you the rate of decline in uh, these three women. Uh, the rate of decline uh, of the PK the tail in pregnancy was within the expected range for non-pregnant women. Um, and the little circles, the red circles, are the time of delivery. And in two of the three women, they still had carbotegravir levels that were three times the protein-adjusted IC90 at the time of delivery. So that's eight to nine months after stopping. So the drug lasts a very long time. Uh, moving to dolutegravir in pregnancy. Uh, this is the results of the VESTED trial, IMPACT 2010. They compared dolutegravir to nafavir uh, TDF. FTC, tenofovir TAF, FTC, and efavirenz tenofovir FTC initiated after the first trimester in HIV positive pregnant women. Um, and you can see the median gestational age at enrollment was about 22 weeks and similar between the arms. These are treatment naive women. And you can see dolutegravir treatment with either TAF or TDF was associated with significantly higher levels of viral suppression, de defined as viral load less than 200, at delivery than efavirenz treatment. In the intent to treat analysis, 97.5% were below 200 in the combined dolutegravir arms compared to 91% in the efavirenz arm, and the data were very similar in the pre-protocol analysis. Dolutegravir TAF was associated with significantly fewer adverse pregnancy outcomes, and this was driven by preterm delivery shown here, than either dolutegravir tenofovir TDF and efavirenz in orange, the light green and the light orange, which had uh, similar rates of adverse outcomes. There were no difference in adverse events between the arms for either the mother or the infant. Although there were fewer needle de neonatal deaths with tenofovir, uh, dolutegravir TAF in the dark green and dolutegravir TDF in the light green compared to efavirenz, although the rate of infant death was low. There were two infant infections. They were both in the dolutegravir arms. One had a maternal delivery viral load of 58,000. However, the other had a delivery viral load of less than 40. This looks at the weekly maternal weight gain, which was significantly higher in the dolutegravir TAF arm 
than in the dark blue, than, uh, than either the diatrigovir chinafavir in the light green or the efavirenz arm in the orange. However, the weekly weight gain was actually less than recommended for the general population. So this important uh, trial showed us that all of the regimens actually had high efficacy, even efavirenz had an efficacy over 90% and safety similar to or better than observed in other studies of treatment in pregnancy. Dalutegravir containing treatment had superior viral efficacy at delivery compared to a Favrin's treatment. They're continuing to follow the women to 12 months postpartum. Uh, Dalutegravir TAF had fewer adverse pregnancy outcomes driven by lower preterm delivery. And dalutegravir, regardless of whether it was TAF or tenofovir, DD, TDF, had fewer neonatal deaths than efavirenz. And this affirms the WHO recommendations to use dalutegravir in all populations, including uh, during pregnancy, and suggests that TAF may be preferable to TDF in pregnancy, although it is not completely confirmatory. Uh, this is a study from Botswana that now looked at dalutegravir treatment. This is with TDF and postpartum weight gain. So they looked at pregnant women on dalutegravir, 170, or efavirenz, 114, and HIV uninfected women, 122, in an observational study in Botswana. And they assessed the association of dalutegravir with postpartum weight gain over 18 months postpartum, comparing dalutegravir to efavirenz and to HIV uninfected women. So HIV positive women on dalutegravir had a persistently higher weight gain, about five kilos, through 18 months postpartum compared to those on efavirenz, even after adjusting for CD4 viral load uh, and whether they were on treatment at conception. However, when you compared uh, dalutegravir to uninfected women, they actually had similar postpartum weight gain with the dalutegravir being slightly above the uninfected women. And HIV positive women on efavirenz had significantly lower weight gain postpartum compared to uninfected women and women on dalutegravir. Uh, this evaluation looked at um, the changes in dalutegravir use after the neural tube defect safety signal in Botswana. So in Botswana, country guidance after that signal in May 2018 recommended individualized counseling for pregnant women who had already conceived and those desiring pregnancy and for women who were starting, non-pregnant women who were starting, that continued use of dalutegravir treatment. But they didn't specifically mention what to do when you were first starting treatment during pregnancy. So this is a secondary analysis of data between 2016 and 2019, over 20,000 HIV positive deliveries. So if we first look at ART regimen at conception by month of delivery, and here you see this is before the safety warning and this is after the safety warning. Um, and blue shows you dalutegravir ART, uh, red shows you efavirenz ART, and green is other ART. And you can see the percent of deliveries with dalutegravir at conception actually didn't change. 27% of women before, 28% of women after um, were on dalutegravir at conception. But you see something quite different for treatment started during pregnancy. Uh, and here you can see that before the treatment, uh, the neural tube defect warning, almost all of the women were uh, started on dalutegravir treatment. And the vast majority of these were started after six weeks gestational age. However, after the safety warning, 43% of the starts were dalutegravir and 56% were on efavirenz. Again, most of the women who were starting were more than six weeks gestation. So this shows us that program guidance on individualized counseling regarding pregnancy intention had no apparent effect on dalutegravir exposure at conception. However, after the guidance, pregnant women who were first starting treatment more frequently initiated non-dalutegravir treatment, but they did so after the neural tube risk period was already over. 
So clearer public health guidance is needed when signals occur so that uh, this is not seen that women are being started on a favorins when they actually didn't need to be started on a favorins. Uh, this is uh, a multi-cohort European observational study of diotegravir use in pregnant women on the Dolomite EPIC group, and they looked at birth outcomes through February 2019. There were 453 pregnancies uh, who received diotegravir. Out of these, there were 18 induced abortions. One of these induced abortions was due to a birth defect in a woman on preconception dolutegravir who had a neuronal migration disorder, not a neural tube defect. There were 23 spontaneous abortions, all in preconception dolutegravir, and five stillbirths, all again in the preconception dolutegravir group. Um, none, no birth defects there, and 400 live-born singletons, of which 266 here were um, live births. The rate of birth defects was 4.5%, and there were no neural tube defects or other central nervous system defects reported in these 266 women. Uh, the defects were um, genital urinary, cardiac, limb, GI, and other. Um, moving on to HIV testing of children, infant prophylaxis, early infant diagnosis. Uh, this first study looked at the efficacy of maternal HIV risk stratification to identify high-risk infants for birth testing in Zimbabwe. So in Zimbabwe, HIV testing at birth is offered to high-risk infants, which was defined as HIV diagnosed in labor and delivery, starting treatment greater than 32 weeks gestational age, viral load greater than 1,000, seroconversion, and non-adherence to treatment. So at 10 study sites, point-of-care birth testing was done on uh, almost 2,000 HIV-exposed infants, and this was irrespective of risk. Transmission rate was 1.5% but they gave this five item maternal risk screening tool to the mothers of all HIV exposed uh, infants and high risk was defined as a yes to one or more questions. And this shows you the sensitivity, specificity, predictive value, positive and negative predictive value of the risk screening tool, sensitivity 62%, specificity 87%, positive predictive value 7%, negative predictive value, 99%. And when they looked at the questions, they found that the yes to starting antiretroviral treatment late, greater than 32 weeks gestation, had the highest sensitivity in predicting infant HIV infection, while the not adhering to treatment was the least sensitive with the sensitivity of only 7%. If you required two or more yeses to define high risk, the sensitivity decreased from 62 to 59 percent, and requiring three or more yes uh, decreased the sensitivity to three percent. So while it had reasonable sensitivity and specificity, if you use this risk tool to determine who was going to be tested at birth, 38 percent of in utero infected infants would have been missed. This is a study that looked at the cost effectiveness of using broadly neutralizing antibodies for infant HIV prophylaxis. And the reason this is important is because over 50% of residual transmission that's occurring is occurring through breastfeeding and suggests that we may need additional interventions other than what we're currently doing, which is maternal treatment. So this is the CPEC model and they simulated two cohorts of children in South Africa, all HIV exposed infants, and then HIV exposed and high risk infants defined as mothers with viral load over a thousand or um, incident HIV infection. And for each of these cohorts, they compared four strategies looking at life expectancy, costs, and infection. So they compared standard of care, which is oral antiretroviral prophylaxis for six to 12 weeks. Standard of care plus one dose of broadly neutralizing antibody at birth. 
standard of care in two doses at birth and three months, and then finally standard of care and doses at birth and every three months while breastfeeding called extended BNAB. And you can see here the costs that are assumed, seven to $11 for standard of care, $60 per dose for broadly neutralizing uh, antibody. And they found that extended broadly neutralizing antibody was the preferred strategy, both for all children who are HIV exposed, as well as uh, high risk children um, with the incremental cost effectiveness ratio being a little bit lower in the high risk children. This is a sensitivity analysis. So what I want you to pay attention to in this is the green and the blue, which shows cost effectiveness for broadly neutralizing antibody and cost savings. And this is looking at all children identified as exposed. This is looking at high risk infants. This shows you broadly neutralizing antibody efficacy, and this is the cost. And the first thing you see for all uh, HIV exposed infants, extended broadly neutralizing antibody remained the preferred strategy unless efficacy was less than 60 or cost was more than 100. And if you only gave it to high risk infants, it was the preferred strategy unless the efficacy was less than 40 or the cost exceeded 120 per dose. So this is um, encouraging regarding the potential use of this passive immunization strategy. Uh, this study it used PEPFAR data from eight sub-Saharan African countries and assessed the number of new HIV positives who accepted index testing and then evaluated the number of pediatric and adult contacts solicited pediatric in gray, adult in blue, and the percent of children receiving a test who were seropositive, the little red circles. So if you look at the contacts, each index case elicited more adult than pediatric uh, uh, contacts, and that's uh, more blue than gray in all of these situations, all of these countries. And the percent that were pediatric ranged from 12 to 40%. Despite lower numbers being tested, there was actually a high HIV positive yield among the pediatric uh, contacts, the little red balls, ranging from 1.3 to 10.1% with a mean of 5.0% uh, across the eight countries. Showing us that failure to identify child contacts of index patients is a significant missed opportunity to find undiagnosed children. Uh, this was a uh, study from Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation looking at point of care infant diagnostic testing in a stepped wedge implementation study. They looked at point of care at four to six weeks and compared pre point of care, which was standard centralized lab testing, and that's the orange, versus post point of care testing. Uh, in green, the intervention, and 36 sites in Zimbabwe and in Kenya. So here you see the design. They used a hub and spoke model, and for large sites that had a lot of patients, they all had their testing centrally at a hub. And spoke sites were sites that were pretty close uh, by the hub, but um, didn't have as many patients, and they sent their samples to the hub for testing. And this shows you the proportion of infant HIV test results returned to the caregiver within 12 weeks of age. That's this uh, axis here. Comparing the standard of care, step zero to step three, it's up here, to a point of care. And I think it's pretty obvious just looking at the green, that the green were all pretty close to 100, whereas the orange were below. And they differed by country in Zimbabwe. Um, standard of care resulted in less return, whereas in Kenya, where they have enhanced standard of care central lab testing, it was a little bit more. The mean turnaround time for point of care in Zimbabwe was 2.6 days, 0.4 for hub, 7.4 for spoke, compared to 32 days for standard of care. In Kenya, the point of care testing was 0.4 for the hub, 3.4 for the spoke, and 67 days for the standard of care. 
that may be reversed, I think. Uh, this looks at result return and antiretroviral start by country. Um, in Kenya, the, the percent return uh, to caregiver by age 12 weeks was 76% with standard of care to compare to 99.3% with point of care, significantly different. Starting treatment on treat, starting infants who were infected on treatment within 60 days was relatively similar, better with point of care, but pretty high with standard of care. In Zimbabwe, we had a little bit different situation where standard of care had only 21% return to caregiver compared to 93% with point of care and 43% of infants starting treatment within 63, 60 days for standard of care compared to 80% with point of care. And the hub and spoke sites performed relatively similarly for the key clinical outcomes of return by 12 weeks and starting on treatment for H positives compared to the standard of care. Um, this is the CPAC model, and they then took the data that you just saw from Zimbabwe, and they simulated three different strategies. Standard of care lab-based treatment, strengthened lab-based treatment, which is the Kenya data, and point of care from Zimbabwe. So in Kenya, using the strengthened lab, you get results given to 7% fewer infants, return results 50 days later, starting treatment 15% less, but it costs $1.50 less per test. And in the base case scenario, which is using these parameters for the uh, strengthened laboratory, point of care improved uh, short-term survival, improved life expectancy, and uh, had a more efficient use of resources than the strengthened lab. And in sensitivity analysis, point of care remained more cost effective than strengthened lab based EID unless test turnaround time, percent returned, and percent started on treatment with the strengthened lab based treatment uh, EID can actually match that seen with point of care at lower cost. And lowering the cost of point of care will make point of care even more cost effective in the future. So this really speaks for implementation of point of care testing. Now, there's a, a separate study from Zambia that was uh, a little bit less encouraging. Uh, this looked at 4,000 HIV exposed infants who were randomized to point of care testing compared to safety net central lab testing. And safety net means that if no result had returned by four weeks, then they tested an archived uh, specimen. At six clinics in Zambia, with primary outcomes being alive in care and viral load less than 200 at 12 months. So if you look at time to receipt of results, all the infants in the point of care in red received results on the same day while standard of care was 36 days with most of the testing relying on the enhanced uh, testing of an archived specimen. This looks at time to starting treatment in an HIV positive infant. And for the 81 children who were HIV positive, um, starting treatment was high in both arms, but more rapid with point of care than with standard of care. However, when they looked long-term, despite rapid diagnosis and treatment start in infected children, adverse long-term outcome was common. And of the 81 infected infants, there were 15 deaths, 15 lost to follow-up, and uh, 30 had viral failure. And by 12 months, only 25% of the HIV-positive infants were alive in care and suppressed. It was higher in the point-of-care arm. 30% than the standard of care arm, 19%, but still that's a little bit discouraging. It doesn't mean point of care doesn't work. It means that we're not doing good follow-up of the infants who are infected. I uh, want to talk a little bit about HIV-free survival and um, HIV and antiretroviral exposed but uninfected children. Uh, the first study comes from the Universal Treatment Search Study in Uganda, Kenya. 
Um, and in that study, 32 uh, communities in Uganda and Kenya received population HIV testing with a coverage of 90%, and they were randomized to an intervention, um, which was immediate treatment, annual testing, uh, and streamlined care. I'll show you that in a moment. And control, which was HIV care per national guidelines. At year three, there was 1,417 births to 1,332 women known to be HIV positive, and they were able to uh, ascertain infant outcome in uh, almost 80% in both arms. So here you have the percent died or HIV infected, and here you have mother to child transmission and intervention in blue versus control. And you can see that the universal testing and patient-centered care reduced three-year population level infant HIV infection mortality by 50% and reduced uh, mother-to-child transmission from 3.7% to 0.5% in women with known HIV infection. And there was higher maternal viral suppression at year three in the intervention compared to control, 86% versus 81%. So this intervention of immediate treatment and streamlined care worked pretty well for MTCT. Uh, this study looked at the ANRS PROMISE PEP study. And this study compared 50 weeks of infant prophylaxis with either lopinavir, ritonavir, or 3TC as prophylaxis against postnatal breastfeeding uh, infection. That study showed that both were equally effective and safe, but they had found slower growth in those on lopinavir, ritonavir through 50 weeks. And so they compared growth neuropsych and clinical data on about 50% of those who were enrolled uh, at age five to seven years and compared lopinavir, ritonavir to 3TC. And you can see from the graphs of detail that there were no differences in growth, no differences in neuropsych testing, mental health, or clinical outcomes in HIV-exposed uninfected infants with um, a year exposure to either lopinavir, ritonavir, or 3TC. Very reassuring. Uh, this looks at malnutrition in HIV-exposed uninfected infants in long-term follow-up from the PROMISE tri trial. And they evaluated the rate of severe growth faltering and the correlates of stunting in about 1,500 HIV-exposed uninfected children who are now aged two to five years from the PROMISE trial uh, followed from birth in four African countries. And you can see that the mean Z-scores were below the population height and weight norms across the measurements in these uh, almost 1,500 infants, with stunting found in 23%, underweight in 5%, wasting in 1.8%. And when they looked at the correlates associated with stunting uh, by country, Malawi um, had uh, more stunting than did the other countries. Mothers who didn't complete secondary school was associated with higher rates of stunting and older age. Uh, this looks at um, a cohort of HIV positive women on treatment and uninfected pregnant women and their infants followed from birth in South Africa. So these are all uninfected infants, some HIV exposed, some HIV unexposed, and medical records were reviewed for hospitalizations in the neonatal period. There were similar rates of neonatal hospitalization, 13% HIV exposed, 16% HIV unexposed, and no significant difference in overall hospitalization rate or frequency of infectious events. However, Hospitalized HIV exposed uninfected children had a two to three fold increased risk of being either early preterm or very low birth weight, indicating increased severity of adverse birth outcomes in HIV exposed infants. And they also had a two fold higher risk of uh, ICU admission, in indicating increased disease severity in the neonatal period. And this is expanded on a little bit in this study from South Africa that actually is now published in Lancet Child Adolescent Health. 
And this is a cohort of HIV positive women starting treatment in pregnancy and uninfected uh, pregnant women with uh, 12 months follow-up of the infant postpartum, and they evaluated infection-related hospitalizations. HIV exposed uninfected children uh, in, in red um, had a 3.5-fold increased risk of infection-related hospitalizations in the age group of eight days to three months, uh, but was similar at other ages. HIV exposed uninfected children, again, the red. Uh, this is looking at incidence rate ratio. Um, if the mother was on treatment less than 24 weeks gestation, uh, CD4 greater than 350 and viral load less than 1,000, they were similar to the unexposed children. But women with more advanced disease with late treatment, uh, low CD4, high viral load, they had a higher rate. Um, uh, of infectious hospitalizations compared to the uninfected HIV unexposed children. Uh, similarly, HIV exposed uninfected children were similar to the uh, unexposed children if they were exclusively breastfed and had timely vaccinations, but if either of those wasn't true, um, they were significantly more hospitalizations. Between birth and six months, the HIV-exposed uninfected children had an increased risk of lower respiratory tract infection and diarrhea reported by mother, but this difference resolved after six months. So this study concluded that interventions to improve maternal HIV early diagnosis, early initiation of treatment in infected infants, viral early, early initiation treatment in the mother, sorry, and viral suppression, and exclusive breastfeeding and timely vaccination may actually decrease this early increase in morbidity in these HIV exposed but uninfected children. Uh, now this is a series that looks at early treatment and cascade of care and drugs in children. Uh, this first study looks at predictors of persisting reservoir in very early treated infants in South Africa. They evaluated the HIV reservoir in 66 infected neonates who'd been uh, identified less than 48 hours after birth uh, and collected samples uh, pre-treatment in 1636 and 12 months after treatment was started. 31 of these infants started treatment at less than 48 hours of age and the remaining 32 at a median seven days. 75% were infected despite maternal treatment. So they found that infant HIV DNA significantly correlated with concurrent HIV viral load uh, and was lowest, DNA was lowest in those who had uh, viral load undetected with 23% of them having undetectable DNA. Multivariate analysis of factors associated with DNA copies in the first year post-treatment included age the infant started at treatment, 48 hours versus seven days, uh, pretreatment CD4, whether or not the mother had treatment and duration of treatment. Uh, this is a study that is a multi-center cohort in Mozambique and South Africa called EARTH, um, enrolling HIV-positive infants starting treatment in the first three months of life. And they evaluated risk factors for poor outcome, which was defined as death or progression to WHO stage three or four or CD4 less than 25% in 135 infants that have enrolled to a date with the median age of starting treatment, 38 days, so at a month, and a median follow-up that's relatively short. 32 infants, 24% had poor outcomes with 9% dying, 5% progressing clinically, and 12% having uh, immune decline. Determinants of poor outcome after adjusting for site, baseline weight for age Z-score, and treatment regimen were what the viral load was during follow-up with a 2.7-fold increased risk of an adverse uh, outcome for each log increase of viral load in follow-up. And just like the other one, age at start of treatment with a 1.5-fold increased risk of poor outcome for each month of delay in initiation of treatment. 
the earlier treatment, the better. Uh, this looked at um, the cascade of HIV care for children and adolescents in West Africa from the IDEA pediatric cohort, nine sites in five countries, uh, 7,750 treatment naive children and youths. They had continued holes in the pediatric care cascade, even though this went through recent uh, years through 2018. 22% attrition before treatment was even started um, with a large loss to follow up. Significantly lower treatment access in children under five years compared to those 10 to 15 years. Kids who were less than two years were 41% less likely to start treatment. Two to four years, 16% less likely to start treatment. Very low access to viral load testing, only 65% had a viral load test and suboptimal viral suppression, which was less than 500 copies per ml. And those tested, uh, only 53% were suppressed. So continued problems in pediatric care in West Africa. Uh, this is from the PREDICT trial that was done in um, Thailand and Cambodia, looking at long-term outcomes. So the PREDICT study enrolled antiretroviral naive uh, children aged one to 12 years with CD4 15 to 24%, and they were randomized to immediate treatment versus deferred treatment till CD4 was less than 15%. And that study at three years of follow-up found no difference in AIDS-free survival, but better CD4 count. And so this is a 10-year follow-up study to evaluate long-term outcomes in almost 80% of the children. So you can see immediate treatment. We're looking now here at the last visit. Immediate treatment resulted in 10 years superior immune status. CD4 was greater than 500 in 88% with immediate compared to 76% with deferred treatment. Immediate treatment had a trend at 10 years towards higher rates of undetectable viral load. Here's immediate, 86% undetectable compared to 78% with deferred, and a lower risk of viral failure, which was 22.8% in the immediate group, 34.3% um, in the deferred group. So again, showing the importance of early initiation of treatment. There was no difference in growth by timing of treatment, but please note that both groups of HIV-infected kids had a worse growth growth than either HIV exposed uninfected kids or HIV unexposed kids. This looked at the PK of raltegravir in HIV TB co-infected infants and children um, age four weeks to two years. This comes from the IMPACT P1101 dose finding study. They looked at the raltegravir chewable tablet at 12 milligrams per kilogram per dose given twice daily and 13 kids receiving rifampin TB uh, therapy. And here were the PK targets, and here were the mean values for the cohort. The PK targets were met, and there were no treatment-related adverse events. So a double dose of raltegravir, the chewable tablet can be crushed and dispersed in water, uh, can be given to TB, HIV co-infected, very young children giving adequate PK levels uh, and was found to be safe. Moving on to adolescents. Uh, this looked at age-specific HIV incidence patterns, and they used a Bayesian model to construct age-specific HIV incidence and mortality by age and sex from a variety of different population-based zero surveys um, from several different countries, as you can see here. Uh, this looks at the mean age of infection at the site by sex over time. So here are men and here are uh, women. And you can see the age-specific incidence patterns varied by site, but women tended to become infected at a younger age than men at each site. And while average age at infection has slightly increased in most sites since 2000, there were really minimal changes over time. Most of these lines are pretty straight. 
This looks at the proportion of new infections by age groups and sex. And what I want you to look at is the light orange and the dark orange, which is the age group 15 to 19 and 20 to 24. And here we have women and here we have men. And in all sites in the most recent estimate, so looking out here at 2015, about half of all women's new infections were among adolescent girls and young women between 15 and 24 years. And in men, it was about a quarter were in adolescent boys and um, young men. So adolescent girls, we already know this, adolescent girls and young women, high risk. Uh, this is looking in Botswana, uh, in a, at the Botswana Combination Prevention Randomized Trial, which showed a 30% decrease in community HIV incidence with expanded testing, linkage to care, and universal treatment. Um, and 30% of the residents enrolled in the study received HIV testing two times or more, and this report evaluated incident infection rates in these repeat testers. Overall, the incidence rate was 0.17 per 100 patient years, but you can see females had a significantly higher incidence rate than did males. And the highest incident rate was in females 16 to 24, whereas in males it was 15 to 34. Gender and age were both significantly associated with HIV incidence, and there was a seven-fold increased hazard of incident infections in young women. Uh, age 16 to 24, very similar to the data we just saw. This looks at the PEPFAR DREAMS intervention success. So this used population-based data from girls age 15 to 24 who participated in a community cohort survey in Rakai uh, between 2018 and 2019 where they reported on HIV risk behaviors and were tested for HIV to evaluate partici uh, participation in any of the DREAMS programs, either the Stepping Stones participatory intervention, and that's delineated here, several sessions promoting sexual health, uh, combined social economic approaches, SES, and HIV testing. So if we look at coverage of the services, of the children uh, 979 aged 15 to 19 years, 31% participated in the stepping stones, 24% socioeconomic, and 39% HIV testing. Participation in age 20 to 24 years in blue was significantly less. And if we look at, uh, just at the completeness of the stepping stone sessions by age, 46% um, of those 15 to 19 in orange completed 10 or more sessions whereas 32% of the young women 20 to 24 in blue completed those sessions. This now looks at reported sexual behavior. So if we look at the girls age 15 to 19 participating in the stepping stone sessions, you can see almost a dose response curve. There was a significant decrease in all of these different sexual risk behaviors among those who completed 10 or more stepping stone sessions. Whereas in younger women aged 20 to 24 who participated, there was really no significant difference in sexual risk behaviors. The combined socioeconomic strengthening approach had no effect on sexual risk behaviors regardless of age, and the HIV testing also did not affect sexual risk behavior. So not that great results. Um, this looks at data from Kenya. And it's a cross-sectional analysis of electronic me medical record data on over 10,000 youth on treatment for more than six months receiving care in 99 clinics in Kenya. Overall viral suppression was 73% and only 14% of the clinics had suppression rates over 80%. Viral suppression was lower uh, with younger age and male sex, so less likely to be suppressed if you're under 19 or you're male. And uh, only 14% of clinics had greater than 80% suppression. And when they looked at characteristics of clinic factors associated with poor suppression, they found a longer turnaround time, 
that Mission Faith Foundation did better than non-Mission Faith Foundation, no social worker, not having an adolescent space was poor suppression. And if you were residing in a low to medium HIV burden area, rather than a hyper endemic or high HIV burden area, so maybe less experience in dealing with HIV infected adolescents. This looks at linkage to care after test and start in youth in rural Uganda from, again, Rakai. There was no significant difference between the proportion of youth and adults who received HIV testing. This line here is pretty much the same. However, despite increases in treatment over time in both adults and adolescents, there was lower uptake in youth, 49% compared to 71% in adults, brown versus blue. Uh, and there was an increased risk of youth not starting treatment that was associated with male sex, not being married, uh, currently sexually active, and a decreased uh, risk if not of not starting treatment if they didn't use alcohol. This looks at bone and renal outcomes in HIV positive youth who switched from a Bacavir to Tenofovir based treatment in South Africa. So these were all kids who were Tanner stage four, weight greater than 40 kilos, and switched from a Bacavir to TDF. And they evaluated bone mineral density, bone formation resorption markers, and renal function six months after the switch. So for bone, they saw no significant overall change in bone mineral density or markers between the before and after TDF switch, but 32% of youth had either no change or a decrease at a time when they actually should be increasing. And of these, most were female. Um, from the renal aspect, there was a statistically significant change in serum creatinine and GFR decrease, but it was not viewed as clinically significant. So maybe TAF might be better here for these youth, better bone and renal um, findings, but uh, conversely has issues with weight gain and lipids, so there's no perfect regimen. These are data on a promising pilot uh, mental health intervention for HIV positive youth called the Voice of Youth in Tanzania. And they did a step wedge evaluation and you can see the intervention here. It's uh, several different sessions. Um, two are joint with caregivers and individual sessions and they are delivered by um, young group leaders. They had data on 93 youth with the six month follow-up visit and they found in both groups improved mental health and internal stigma um, between those who were getting the intervention and before the intervention. Self-reported adherence improved, standardized levels of uh, antiretrovirals in the hair improved, and viral suppression improved with uh, the intervention. So that looks uh, promising. Uh, this comes from uh, the United States. It's, I think, the only one I'm showing from the U.S. Uh, and it looks at uh, use of integrase inhibitors and weight gain. So this is 69 youth aged less than 24 years with a median of 18 years who started an integrase inhibitor-based regimen and had at least two BMI recorded six months apart. Uh, and within two uh, years pre and post INSTE, and they compared the trajectories. And here you can see that compared to the pre INSTE part, here's pre INSTE here and pre INSTE here for BMI and BMI for age Z score. During the post INSTE initiation period, these youth tended to increase in BMI and had significantly higher rates of increase for BMI for age score. So the Increase in weight with integrase inhibitors appears to occur also in youth. Um, moving to PrEP and pregnant women in adolescence. Uh, this is IMPACT 22009. Looked at tenofovir diphosphate in dried blood spots um, in pregnant and postpartum women under directly observed therapy. Um, and they found that intracellular tenofovir diphosphate was actually 
31 to 37 percent lower in pregnant versus postpartum women. Here you have the time profiles in pregnant women versus postpartum women. Uh, the clinical significance of this is unclear. There's no protective level that's known. Uh, so that looks at another study which used population PK modeling to evaluate whether a double dose of PDFFTC might be needed during pregnancy. And the simulation showed that if you looked at the standard dose, 47%, 62% uh, on standard dosing would have second and third trimester levels below the estimated protective level. Uh, but with the simulation, uh, 600 milligrams uh, resulted in very few women falling below the protective level, suggesting a study of double dosing in pregnancy may be warranted. This looks at prenatal exposure to PrEP and uh, birth outcomes. This is uh, 4,261 women who uh, delivered as of 2020 in Kenya, 721 PrEP exposed, and there were no significant differences in birth outcomes between the infants born to mothers on PrEP or not PrEP in birth weight, birth length, and any of these adverse outcomes, PrEP unexposed is pink, PrEP exposed in orange. So that's very reassuring. Um, this study looked at um, PrEP adherence as measured by the electronic monitoring WISE pill device in young women. Found that interest in PrEP was high, about 50% uh, at month one had uh, uh, on, were adherent to PrEP but it significantly decreased over time as seen in other studies. And the only baseline factor significantly associated with high adherence was voice risk score, which is defined up here, with actually lower adherence in those with a higher risk score, which is here. So novel approaches are needed to help young women understand risk and how to achieve effective HIV preventions. And for these, these women, it may be that long-acting PrEP is preferable to daily medication. Moving to TB and HIV, uh, this was an important study that looked at rifapentine PK and safety in HIV positive and HIV negative pregnant women on uh, INH and rifampin. Uh, again, an impact study. They found that HIV-positive women in blue had a higher clearance and a lower AUC than HIV-uninfected women in orange, resulting in slightly lower rifapentine levels. And that postpartum clearance here in pink was actually 35% higher than antepartum in the HIV-uninfected women, but very similar in the HIV-positive women. No uh, adverse events were reported, and they concluded that no rifapentine dose change was needed in pregnancy, but that they needed to have similar studies done in women on dolutegravir, since all of the women in this study were on efavirenz. And this study looked at TB infection and disease in uh, perinatal uh, HIV adolescents and uninfected kids. Uh, this was from uh, South Africa, where they did annual screening for TB and looked at quantiferon conversion. So here you see this is looking at HIV positive youth. Both quantiferon positivity and TB disease increased with age of use with, with a, a peak at 17 to 19 years. And in an adjusted analysis, they found no uh, difference in quantiferin seroconversion. I'm looking here at the adjusted hazard ratio. Uh, but there was a significant increase in incident TB disease comparing HIV positive and HIV negative youth. Uh, this looks at community-based services. Uh, this comes from uh, a, an analysis of the four large cluster randomized universal test and treat uh, studies. And they found that non-suppression in HIV positive persons was associated with higher HIV incidence. So this is the proportion of all adults with viral non-suppression, all HIV positive adults. And there up here is HIV incidence. Uh, and the individual studies are shown in different colors. And you can see as non-suppression goes up, incident goes up, 
in each of the studies with an increase of 0.2 per 100 person years for each 10% increase in non-suppression and in each study. Uh, this looked at the search study again. This is uh, the study of 32 communities. They randomized to the intervention versus standard of, of care. The intervention is outlined here, streamlined care interventions, and they evaluated viral suppression at three years in um, adults and they stratified by whether they were treatment experience with or without baseline viremia or antiretroviral naive, all of them were linked to care. So you can see viral suppression uh, was improved with the intervention here in both men and women. The greatest improvement was seen in those who were antiretroviral experienced with baseline viremia. And this was because they had more time in care and fewer missed visits, and this was similar by sex. And while few switched to second line, there was more that switched in the intervention group and more viral suppression after switch. So this appears to have uh, been very good, particularly for those who were um, treatment experienced. This looks at a health scout. Uh, intervention. This is a randomized trial in Rakai to look at the impact of community health workers using motivational interviewing strategies and mHealth. And they did a community-wide survey with viral load testing if HIV positive. And at the end of study, HIV care coverage and antiretroviral coverage were significantly approved with this community-based intervention, but unfortunately not viral suppression or prevention as measured by male circumcision. This looks at multi-month dispensing of treatment in Lesotho. Again, in adults, uh, there were 30 health facilities and they were randomized to either three-month supply at a health facility, three-month supply community treatment groups, and six-month supply community treatment groups. So the three month and six months were non-inferior to the facility-based three month in terms of retention, viral suppression, mortality, and loss to follow up. And the three month and six months were also not significantly different, suggesting that a differentiated care with six months dispensing might be as effective as our current uh, health facility uh, dispensing. This looked at community treatment, increasing viral suppression. This is a study called Do Art, um, Delivery Optimization of Art, which is community-based testing, uh, which was done either in the clinic or at home in a mobile van um, uh, in naive patients. And they were randomized to start treatment in a clinic versus uh, mobile van same, same day start. So they were either tested and started on treatment in a clinic, uh, tested in the clinic, but got their monitoring through a mobile van, or uh, got their testing treatment and monitoring all through a mobile van. And that's the little mobile van right there. So the community-based treatment, the one that was the community group that everything was in the community, resulted in superior viral suppression and also eliminated discrepancies between men and women. women and the treatment. Again, another study suggesting community-based treatment is better. Uh, then the last group of uh, HIV is partner notification. Uh, and these are uh, an analysis of PEPFAR data from 24 countries uh, and looking at HIV test volume. So you can see between 2018 to 2019, the test volume decreased from 92 million to 72 million, uh, while the yield increased from 3.4% to 3.9%. And then when they looked at the type of testing, they found among adults that contact testing had the highest yield of new patients and was the second highest contribution to HIV case finding, suggesting contact testing is important. Um, data from quarter four shows high rates of acceptance of the contact testing in both men and women. Men had more contacts than women, 
contribution to case finding was greater among men than women, but male contacts of index, women index cases had the highest HIV rate. Uh, and then last, this is three different studies that looked at a different ways of doing assisted partner notification. In Botswana, they have counseling to encourage index partners, and the counselors offer to see them jointly, but they do not directly notify. In Uganda, they um, have uh, healthcare workers will contact partners by phone or by home visit. And in Rwanda, they have active case finding, either client referral, provider referral, or dual referral. And this shows you definitions that we're going to look at in uh, graphs reaches the percent of new uh, HIV positives who received partner notification. Contact is the number of partners named over the number of index. Testing is number of partners tested. And case finding is the number of partners HIV positive. And this is from the three different groups. And just to show you here is the reach, the number of percent of new HIV positives who received the partner testing. And here's our contact index, the number of partners identified per uh, index case. There's our testing, the number that were tested, and there's our case finding. So the countries varied widely in all of these parameters, as you can see. Rwanda had the best parameters, actually, um, for reach, contact index, and testing index, but they had a very low HIV prevalence, low numbers were tested, and hence their case finding was lowest. Whereas Uganda had the highest numbers uh, tested, the highest case finding, but the lowest reach. So the differences between the different types of notification. So I'm going to end with the, the coronavirus stuff, hopefully relatively quickly. Um, so this is just to say the scientific data are changing every day. So for example, on March 10th, Tony Fauci showed this slide of different treatments that are being tested. On March 18th, there was a publication in the New England Journal showing no benefit of one of the things that he noted was being uh, tested. So I'm going to briefly present limited data on pregnant women and children, shedding, and tr clinical trials. So these are the studies uh, in pregnancy. There are two very good reviews that are noted up here, and these are the studies that were published. These reviews report on 32 and 38 cases that I think uh, completely overlap. Um, they found that the clinical characteristics in pregnant women were similar to non-pregnant adults. Pregnancy and childbirth didn't aggravate the course of symptoms or pneumonia. Unclear if adverse pregnancy outcomes were more frequent. And importantly, no confirmed cases of intrauterine transmission uh, and all neonatal specimens tested, including placentas, were negative for um, COVID. This is the data in children. The best study comes from China, uh, over 2,000 patients. The main message here is that the majority of children, 80%, had only mild to moderate disease. Four to 13% were actually asymptomatic. Uh, and importantly, infants under one were at the greatest risk of having severe or critical disease. And this other is a smaller case series. I just wanted to point out that 20% uh, had no fever and there was prolonged shedding. Uh, this is a study that was just published two days ago that I thought was important. This is 16 adults who had throat swabs while they were hospitalized until they were PCR negative. So day zero is first day of symptoms. The orange boxes show you viral detection. The first box is the first day. Uh, and the last box is the first day of a negative PCR, and the little blue dots show you resolution of symptoms. And the important note here is that half of the patients were shedding virus for up to eight days after their symptoms had resolved. This is on uh, the types of treatments. I'm not going to go over this in detail. You can get the slides from, uh, from UNICEF a number of different targets, replication, prevention of entry, uh, immune response. But the thing I wanted to point out is that there are a huge number of studies, 158 studies in clinicaltrials.gov as of yesterday. Nine, most of these are in China, 19 are in the US. 
The studies in US are all in adults. They uh, specifically exclude pregnant women. There are um, one, two, three, three studies of remdesivir. Uh, there is a, two studies of uh, post-exposure prophylaxis of contacts with hydroxychloroquine. Um, and there are some studies using monoclonal antibodies. And WHO has a multi-country adoptive study. Does it appear to be an increased risk or severity with HIV, um, although the risk from immune suppression is not known? But while data to date don't, in, don't indicate an increased risk with HIV, I wanted to point out that disease has been in low prevalence countries with HIV and not yet in areas with a high HIV prevalence. But it's starting and we need to monitor it. And this is data from yesterday at 9 a.m. 37 countries in Africa have at least one case with over 1,500 confirmed cases reported to WHO. And these are the numbers here. And to end with, this is a list of some resources that you can go to to get more information um, about uh, COVID and COVID and HIV. And I think that is it. Thank you so much again, Lynn, for this excellent presentation. Uh, we now have up to 10 minutes for questions and answers, and we will take all questions from the chat box. So the first question is from Felix Mboya. Um, what determines viral load for children born with HIV? I've seen two children viral load comparing one that was 5,800 and the other one 4,000. So they're talking about children that are in utero infected. So one thing that can affect the uh, level of virus found with in utero infection may be whether or not the mother is receiving treatment. Um, because if the mother's receiving treatment, it's certainly possible that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there goes that cough. Um, it's certainly possible that the viral load may be lower. I think that's, Okay. Another question from Waller. Um, did the IADS study in West Africa show data for attrition along the cascade for adolescents? Um, may have missed it, uh, but if it was presented already, the person will look at the presentation when shared. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, another question, Ronnie Lovich, Lynn, were, any were there any data on zero conversion and on postnatal viral load, viral suppression disaggregated by age? And if so, mm. did you see differences between younger and older mothers? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I don't believe any of the studies that I cited here showed data by age, because if there was, if they had, I probably would have shown it on the slide. So I don't think so. Okay. Another question from Narmada. Uh, Acharya, sorry if I'm not <laughs> pronouncing it correctly. Is there any difference in risk for COVID-19 between people living with HIV on ART and people living with HIV that are not air on ART? I is think this, so far? It's, a, it's a really important question and the answer is we really don't know. And one of the problems is, is that you know, China and Europe and the US and even Brazil have low HIV prevalence. So we really haven't seen uh, a lot of infection within HIV positive individuals. And it's only when we unfortunately are beginning to see cases in Africa that maybe we'll be able to answer the questions about the effect of HIV better. Right now, um, all of the major groups say that there is no difference with HIV. Um, they all have the caveat that if you're immune suppressed or you're not on treatment, you might be at more risk, but there really are very limited data. Okay. Another question from Francisco Ramirez, and this is a question that I like very much. First of all, he's just saying thank you so much for a really rich, well-rounded scope um, of a variety of findings. And then he's asking for your big picture take on what you've presented. So from your perspective, you know, what are the key takeaways? What surprises you the most from the evidence um, presented this year or what jumps at you? What is of greater importance? Hmm. Um, 
Well, that's a good question. So um, I have to think about it a little bit. I, I think that a lot of the data were things we already knew. Adolescent girls and young women are at higher risk. Um, seroconversion during pregnancy is still a problem. Um, I, you know, uh, postpartum viremia still occurs uh, and mother to child transmission is more common in them. So I think the things that I thought were most valuable and new were the VESTA trial um, where we uh, have data on large numbers receiving not just dolutegravir but TDF versus TAF. Uh, the first data that are reassuring about TAF in pregnancy, so that, that I thought was uh, was important uh, and and verifying, I think, uh, finally, uh, you know, that we can't question that dolutegravir is superior to efavirenz in um, reducing viral load at delivery. So I, I thought, you know, the safety data from that study were important. Um, the reason I presented the broadly neutralizing antibody study was because of the fact that we continue to see viremia postpartum, we continue to see breastfeeding transmission, and we are studying some of the new monoclonals like VRCO1 uh, LS that could be given, you know, every six months. And the idea of being able to provide additional passive prophylaxis on top of antiretroviral therapy in the mother is very attractive, but one of the things that has been criticized is that it's too expensive, it can't be implemented. And I thought that the CPAC analysis kind of laid uh, the falseness of that, that, that actually broadly neutralizing antibody might be pretty cost effective if we uh, can find an appropriate regimen that's highly effective and costless. Thank you for this excellent um, summary of a summary. We have um, another question about the IDEA cohort in West Africa. Um, Laura Broyles is asking whether that cohort showed any improvements in the cascade over time. So before 2012 uh, versus the period 2012 to 2018. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to of your mind you can remember. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see. I I don't remember. I don't I don't think that there was I don't think there was great improvement um, uh, by by time, but um, I would have to look at the slide again. Yeah, maybe for both for Laura and Wally, we can um, take a better look at those slides again after the webinar. Um, and, and give an answer to those more detailed questions. Then a question from Justin Mandala. Um, what to do with pregnant women seroconverting? So from a public health perspective, would you advise um, an aggressive retesting strategy in the context of PMTCT? The answer to that's yes. <laughs> I think, you know, testing in, in, in high HIV prevalence areas, um, testing at least twice during pregnancy and then every couple of months postpartum, I think is important for prevention of transmission, but also for maternal health, um, at least for the first six months postpartum, as uh, the data published in JID suggest, an increased risk of transmission per sex act uh, through six months postpartum. So in late pregnancy through six months postpartum. Um, in terms of what to do, well, you know, you'd start that woman on treatment immediately. And if it's uh, postpartum, you might want to put the infant on prophylaxis as well, um, depending on whether or not you consider that a high risk exposure. Um, some would put the infant on more than one drug because the mother has just um, zero converted. Uh, the idea of having that passive immunization to me is pretty attractive as well. Thank you again, Lynn. Um, completely agree. And we definitely also recommend a quite aggressive retesting strategy. Um, any other questions? It looks like there was a question on point of care um, that, that was talking, I think, about the CPAC uh, data that, that used the data from Zimbabwe and Kenya. So 
and uh, I believe it was Kenya, I forget which country it was, had um, strengthened lab systems where they enhanced their transport and they had SMS um, for, for uh, transmitting results more quickly and point of care um, still was superior to uh, the lab. So they ask, how, how do we integrate into programs on a large scale? Well, I think that the um, EGPATH evaluation did do that. It integrated into programs on a large scale. I refer you to the Lancet paper um, uh, that uh, reviewed the data on that, as well as the slide that looked at the um, implementation evaluation. Okay, then another question from Lisa. She's asking if you have any insights on infant ART resistance um, in infants who get infected after in utero exposure to mothers on ART and through breast milk, ARVs, and infant ARV prophylaxis. Yeah, so there weren't any studies on this at this CROI, but other studies have uh, suggested um, that you can get pretty high rates of antiretroviral resistance in such infants, um, either that are infected in utero through mother receiving treatment, but more importantly, mothers on treatment and they're breastfeeding and they're on uh, antiretroviral therapy. So um, this is, I think, one reason why the move to dolutegravir is so important. Uh, for children and infants, and hopefully infants as soon as we get the PK, PK data for the younger children, um, because the uh, rates of resistance to NNRTIs are very high uh, when you do surveillance in uh, infected infants prior to getting treatment. Uh, so use of dolutegravir in this situation would uh, have a great advantage for those infants. Okay, so then we'll I think we're almost out of time, so we'll just take one last question um, coming from Montoya's. In the use of PrEP during adolescence, uh, were there any results in the percentage of compliance, and especially in any particular group? Um, yeah, so I think uh, one of the studies I, I showed um, where they had the WISE pill looking at monitoring adherence found um, decreasing adherence over time. And I, I think that's true of almost all of the PrEP studies. Um, prior studies, other than that one, have shown that women who view themselves at more high risk, so for example, they know they have an HIV positive partner, are more likely to adhere to PrEP than those who don't think they're at risk and that there may be actually seasons of risk where people feel they're more at risk and more likely to use PrEP. Um, uh, but I, don't, I haven't seen any study that has really been able to figure out how to improve compliance, particularly in youth. Okay, thank you once again for all the questions, uh, the presentation and the answers. Um, we will now have to conclude the Q&A and the webinar. Uh, and as always, we will post the PowerPoint, both the shorter version from this webinar, but also a longer version, including more slides, more studies. Um, we will post everything on the childrenandaids.org website. So I'd like to thank once again, Dr. Lynn Mofensen for this excellent webinar and the attention um, to all of the questions asked. And finally, on behalf of UNICEF, I'd like like to say thank you to all of you who took time to join us on the webinar today. Um, we hope it will be useful to you in your work. So thank you, everyone. Um, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.